Thank you for downloading this podcast from the British Theatre Guide. For more information about British Theatre Guide, please visit britishtheatreguide.info. Conrad Nilsson's production of Shakespeare's comedy Much Ado About Nothing for Northern Broadside Theatre Company, which begins its UK tour in February 2019 at the New Vic in Newcastle under Lyme, had a cast change on the first day of rhythms as Rhys Dinsdale had to drop out of the key role of Benedict due to a family illness and Robin Simpson took over the role. I spoke to Robin during the second week of rehearsals and asked him whether that last minute casting put additional pressure on him. Yes, I mean it's a terrible shame about Reese having to leave like that and I was always going to take over the role of Benedict for the very very end of the tour. There's a there's just a week where we're in Germany at a Shakespeare festival in Germany which Reese was never able to do. And I was so I was always going to step up and play Benedict for just four performances. But yes, with Reese literally on the first day of rehearsals having to leave because of family problems, I got an email from Conrad Nelson, the director, that evening saying, look, Reese has had to leave this evening. He probably won't be back, but we don't know for definite. But would you be able to step up with immediate effect? And I emailed back saying, oh, my God, that's ter- terrible. <laughs> yes, of course, I, I will. Yeah. But let me know tomorrow. And then Conrad emailed and said, yes, Reese has had to go, unfortunately. So would you be able to come in? So by Thursday of that first week of rehearsals, I was I was called in because I wasn't due to start actually to the following Monday to play Don John in right. the tour. So luckily, I hadn't actually started learning Don John's lines <laughs> because that had been a waste of my time. But obviously, I hadn't been learning Benedict's line either because I had literally months in which to do that. So I now have days to do learn Benedict rather than months to learn Benedict. So, yes, it's been pressurized in that respect. But, you know, it's a huge opportunity. It's a fantastic opportunity to play him on a, for the length of the tour and for broadsides. And, um, yeah, I'm going to seize the bull by the horns and go for it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Don John's not a bad part, but Benedict is, is a classic role, really, isn't it? Yeah, no, I was, I was very happy with Don John. He's a, he's a really interesting villain and a really interesting yeah. character. And and then the opportunity during the tour to actually play both characters eventually. But, yeah, no, I'm very happy with the role of Benedict, obviously. It's a, it's a fantastic part. Although taking over from an actor that's had to leave, you know, is, is bittersweet. Yeah. So have you had chance to think about approaching the role yet? Have you, or are you just sort of feeling your way at the beginning of rehearsals? Feeling our way a little bit. But, you know, the thing with Benedict is, is we're just, well, with the whole show, really, we're just trying to keep it light and frothy and energized and not to get too leaden down with the too many negative feelings and, and because it is a comedy yeah. and rather than that meaning that there's lots of funny things happening and lots of pratfalls and things like that it just needs the whole thing needs to be really optimistic and fun because there are also darker elements in the play and they will work better if if the rest of the play has been so so light and frothy so really i've sort of had to keep that in the back of my mind with benedict because he he can become a, i guess it's easy maybe for him to become a little sour and a little negative and sarcastic i guess that could be one way of performing him and we don't really want to do that we want him to be an incredibly likable hero even though he's got many faults that's the thing <laughs> he has many faults and a lot of it is bluster and a lot of it is a front. You know, he's a soldier and he's spent most of his time w- with other men. And he's a confirmed bachelor, or at least he says he's a confirmed bachelor. He'll never marry. He, he likes his bachelor life. And we later find out that that's it's just all a front, really. And actually, he is in love with Beatrice. He always has been in love with Beatrice. It's just that events in their past has made him has made that relationship not work for whatever reason. We don't really know what's happened, but it it hasn't worked. And so they're splitting apart. And it's only the events of the play that actually get them back together. And and they realize they do love each other and they are right for each other. And this whole talk about being a bachelor uh, is nonsense. It does depend quite on your relationship with uh, the person playing Beatrice. You've got Isabel Middleton and some of the most memorable parts of this play comedy wise are the banter where you're in where you the, the two characters are insulting each other so are you, are you starting to get that relationship with with the actress now <laughs> well we're very nice to each other in real life yeah <laughs> and Benedict and Beatrice do have this relationship uh where they bicker with, well they're both very intelligent yeah that's so wonderful about about the characters that Shakespeare's written they're both very intelligent people very witty and clever 
people. They love wordplay. And in many ways, you just think, what a perfect match for each other they are. But of course, their wordplay often often degrades into an argument and, um, you know, a bitchiness and a fight, uh, one-upmanship. And that's because of their history, I think. Whereas, I mean, it'd be, it'd be lovely to think that they're, when they do get married at the end of the play, you know, that their relationship is strong and then they they can still do that sort of playful banter, but not, but not have it destructive, you know, yeah. which, is, which is the direction it was going in at the start of the play. When they very first meet, there's that wonderful scene. They haven't seen each other probably for ages, for years, maybe. And they fall immediately into that banter of calling each other names. And it's playful at first, but it quickly, very, very quickly, only in a matter of a few lines, degrades into like name calling. And, um, Yes, it'd be lovely to think that that period of their lives is over and that they, and that they will love and respect each other at the end. But Isabel's great and it's lovely performing with her. I've never worked with her before. It's lovely to meet her. And, and uh, yeah, I think hopefully their relationship's really coming on. Have you worked with Broadsides before? No. So how are you finding working with their methods? <laughs> yeah, no, really, really well. I've, I say no, I haven't actually worked with Broadsides before, but I have worked with Conrad Right. Before uh, I worked with him twice as a director in 2017. And in fact, he directed me here at the New Vic Theatre. So it's it's a very familiar situation, this. So although I've never worked with broadsides before, this is all very familiar to me. So, yeah, it's great. But what's so lovely about what broadsides do is they have such big cast. You know, this is a cast of 15 and half of them are superb musicians. I'm not. <laughs> But most of the other actors are absolutely super. So we've got a wonderful band in the show playing some brilliant music. It's set at the end of the Second World War, this production. So you've got lots of swing and jazz and jive music. And it's just wonderful music. And so that's great to see because Conrad's very excited about it. He, he, loves, he loves to put music and dance and that sort of thing into his broadside shows. And so it's wonderful to, to be involved in something that has that in it. And Conrad, he directs uh, quite physically often. He's, he's a musician as well and a composer, yeah. so music's yeah. important to him. But he he's um, he often puts the physical comedy in there. So are we are we going to get plenty of knockabout comedy in this? Well, we're going to get um, certainly some knockabout comedy. Yes, there's the wonderful. Uh, it's called the gulling scene, which is like the hoaxing scene where they. The characters try to persuade Beatrice and Benedict that they actually love each other and they're hiding in bushes or, you know, they're climbing trees. So there's always great opportunity in those scenes to do a bit of physical comedy. And the, um, you know, we, we, we've got we haven't got trees as such because it's set in an orchard, but we have got poles and things to climb up and we'll have bins to climb into and, and wheelbarrow. We'll have all that sort of thing. So there's lots of room for physical comedy in that, I think. Yeah. Lots yeah. of things to play with. It's going to be a very physical show. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Fast paced, very funny, very, you know, it'll move very quickly. Yeah. It'll be very fast paced. It'll be, it'll be great. One of the um, particular recurring traits of, uh, of broadside productions, apart from the uh, the big cast Shakespeare, is that they perform in lots of different kinds of space. Cause you'll be in the round there at Stoke, yeah. and yeah. then you've got to adapt that to proscenium stages and all sorts of different uh, types of stage. So how, how do you think that's going to work for you? Well, that'll be really interesting, and that's not something I've done before. This is this because it is my first broadsides tour. That will be a new experience for me. What's quite interesting about this tour is that uh, we start off at the New Vic, which is in the Round, and then we'll tour to Lancaster, which will also be in the Round, and then we'll go to Scarborough, which is also in the Round. So actually, for the first several weeks we'll be performing in the Round, and then it suddenly changes with Salisbury Playhouse, where we'll be playing Cross Arch, we'll be playing End On, so we'll have to re-rehearse the show for that. And the crew will have to, uh, you know, realign the lights and everything. It'll be a total change. And then we'll be doing Cross Arch, I think, for most of the rest of the tour. And then in Germany, we'll end in a Globe Theatre sort of construction. So we'll be performing outside in a, in a makeshift Globe Theatre. So it'll be different again. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's going to be challenging, but it's going to be really interesting, I think, moving from one type of theatre to another. And they've all got their different challenges and they've all got their different... Um, uh, exciting possibilities as well so it's yeah that's a really interesting part of it and you're going into shakespeare comedy but you've just come straight out of 
Panto at uh, mm. Lawrence Batley with them um, playing Widow Twanky with Joyce Branner. And I was looking at, I think the last time I saw you on stage was probably another one of Joyce's pieces, uh, JB Shorts in Manchester, when uh, you were doing a 15 minute version of Wuthering Heights. Yes. <laughs> so. Yes. Uh, You've got to learn. You've got to learn something from doing the physical stuff like that with Joyce. Uh, does that feed into your Shakespeare comedy? Do you think? I think so. I think every every job you do sort of feeds into uh, what you do in the future. Yeah, I mean, doing that fifteen minute Wuthering Heights was a great experience because of the number of characters that you have to play. You know, you have to come on and you have to immediately become uh, a, diff- a character and then say three lines and go off and change a hat and come on and do a different character and. Um, there's a, I've, I've done a lot of comedy in my time and it's lovely working with various practitioners, you know, whether they come in to teach you how to clown or whether they come in and teach you how to, you know, like a fight call, uh, like a fight, uh, a fight instructor will come in and teach you how to fall properly and, and things like that. And it's wonderful to have that sort of knowledge and just build up your knowledge as, as your career goes on and and um, use it from time to time in, in new shows and go, oh, I've done that. Or, oh, I know how to do that. I'll, I'll put that little bit in the show. And it's lovely. But working with Joyce is, is great. I've worked with Joyce a few times and she's, she's absolutely fantastic. And um, it's a great joy to do the panto in Huddersfield. I've done it for the last two years now. now. And yeah, um, being the dame and being Huddersfield's dame is a great honour. And it's a, it's a lovely thing to do. And the Huddersfield audiences have been fantastic. Yeah, because it's a new thing to them. It's just recently been brought back to Huddersfield, hasn't it, the, the panto? Yeah, they, um, they, this, so we did Aladdin this, this Christmas, and it was only their third panto that they produced. And it's taken off incredibly well. You know, the audience numbers have grown and grown. The shows, I, I believe, have got better and better. And, yeah, it's just what they've done in so short a space of time has been incredible, really. So hats off to the LBT for that. They've done a really good job. Yeah. With a great team as well, with, with Joyce, who's very experienced at, at directing Panto, and Andrew Pollard, who's one of the best Panto writers in, in the business at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Joyce, what Joyce doesn't know about Panto isn't worth writing, you know, on the back or whatever. And, and Andrew's scripts are just fantastic. He writes uh, several scripts a year, I think. And obviously, he's yeah. own at Greenwich Theatre, I believe. He's the dame down at Greenwich. And so, yes, they're, they're both incredibly knowledgeable about pantomime. Yeah, absolutely. Very wise people. And you mentioned before that this is a an actor-musician piece as well, which uh, which is something that's, that's growing quite a lot these days. But uh, you're not a musician. <laughs> no, I'm a very bad one. <laughs> <laughs> if uh, I can, I can uh, fiddle around on a mandolin, but that's about it, really. No, I've always wanted to be able to play a musical instrument. I've dabbled in the piano and violin and... Uh, Oh, yeah, I've dabbled a lot and not really achieved anything, to be honest. So, I mean, luckily, working with Conrad a couple of times previously, I think he knows that I'll be able to bring other things to the table anyway. And, you know, I've not got a bad voice, a bad singing voice, so I can always I can always do that too. But then it turns out that in the end I'm playing Benedict, so actually I don't really have much time to no. play musical <laughs> instrument as it happens. So it's probably, you know, it's worked out all right in the end. <laughs> <laughs> so what place does music and song play in, in this production? Well, we have several big musical numbers in the show. We have a big song at the beginning, which introduces all the different characters. And then we'll have in the play, there's a party scene where it's like a masked ball in the original Shakespeare. We're doing it as a fancy dress party. And of course, there'll be the band playing then as well. And there'll be some a cappella singing, barbershop quartet type singing and some solo singing and and then at the end there's a big party where everyone celebrates and everyone marries each other and everyone's happy and there's a big dance so yeah I, there's a lot of music in it it's and it's integral to it really you know if you look at the play itself that Shakespeare wrote you know there are instances where there's obviously music played even back in his day there would have been there would have been music played and at the end Benedict literally says come on Piper's do your thing and play the music and uh, let's all have a dance. That's what he literally says at the end of the show. So, yeah, it's integral to it. And uh, what's the atmosphere like in rehearsals? You're at the second week, so you're uh, still getting to grips with the script, I assume. So what, uh, what are you actually on at the moment? 
We looked this moment. We actually had a fight instructor in this moment because we were looking at the wedding, which if you know the play, you, you know it doesn't end Oh, it doesn't go particularly well. No. Um, it's hence the not fight a, instructor. Yeah, it, it, that hence the fight instructor. Yes, <laughs> most weddings. Well, it depends how much drink has been drunk. But yes, most weddings don't start with a fight. Um, but this one does. And, it, and it's not so much a fight as poor Hero gets thrown around quite a bit by her dad. And so we just wanted to make sure that that was safe and that she doesn't land awkwardly on her back or go flying into any chairs or anything like that. And so that's why the fight instructor was in. So that we looked at that this morning. Um, we also looked a little bit this morning at the scene at the end of the party when Claudio believes that Hero's gone off with Don Pedro and he's in love with her and Beatrice has called me names and I'm upset with her. So everyone's upset with everyone else and everyone's sulking. It all works out all right in the end, but everyone's sort of sulking. So we looked at that scene as well. But we're doing pretty well, I think. I think we're in a very good place at the moment. I've still got quite a few lines to learn personally what i've done is i've i've left learning all my speeches to last just so that when we're doing scenes with other actors i'm not slowing them down really so i've learned all my scenes pretty much but yes whenever it comes to my speeches it sort of grinds to a halt because i have to go and find the script and uh, so uh, what i've my next challenge is to get off book with all the all the um all the speeches and then uh and then we'll be set and then we'll have third week of rehearsals and tech week and we'll open a week on Friday. So we've got just over two weeks before we open. Right. So if I ask you again how it's going in another week yeah. and a half's time, it might be a different answer. <laughs> I might be in tears. I might be, who knows? But um, at the moment, I think we're in a good spot. But I do need to, I, I, I would be, I'll be a lot happier when my lines are in. But there's so many and I've had obviously no uh, preparation time beforehand that it's just a case of learning them at, at every opportunity I, I very rarely go anywhere without my script at the moment and so I just constantly look at it all hours of the day yeah as soon as I wake up I pull the script out of my bag and I start looking at it while I'm boiling the kettle for a coffee you know so it's just always there because uh, it has to go in yeah safety blanket <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah well, it's never far from me yeah how does the um, historical setting work? You said it's set, is, is it the Second World War, do you say? And that that's, I've seen on the, the poster, it has that sort of 1940s look to it. So how does that work with the play? I think it's a really nice setting. It's going to be set, I believe, in Yorkshire. I'm not 100% convinced on that, but I think it is. It's right at the end of the Second World War because the play itself is set at the end of a war and the soldiers are returning home. And I guess the designer and Conrad, uh, Liz Evans is the designer, I guess they decided it would be a lovely romantic time to stage the play you know they, and it is very romanticized isn't it the second world war yeah the clothes are fantastic the soldiers are actually raf not army so they're all dressed in their blues you know they're looking very smart and handsome and and the women are all dressed in their wonderful sort of flowing flowery dresses although it starts and what what's quite interesting is that when it starts the women are, are sort of dressed in their wellies and overalls and they're you know they're working the fields because they were land girls that's what the women had to do wasn't it and i guess the play's commentary is about the relationship between men and women and that sort of i guess it's been a lot in the press recently that toxic masculinity that can happen when a, you get a bunch of men together and these are soldiers they're in the army they're in the raf and they've been just on their own, men with men, for an awful long time. And I guess that sort of breeds that sort of toxic masculinity. And it does come out in the play when they lambast Hero. They believe, you know, Claudio and indeed Don John, the, the evil brother, they, they believe him over the word of a, of a young girl. Even her father disbelieves her because the men have said otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so I think it will be interesting seeing the play set at that time because like at the end of the First World War as well, that was when suddenly women found themselves fulfilling the role of men yeah. and that equality was inching closer and closer i guess and then to have a bunch of men come back and some of them that sort of toxic masculinity sort of comes to the fore again is is really uncomfortable yeah try to reassert that um, the power relationship that they had before the war sort of thing i guess i guess so i guess so yeah yeah um, and it obviously all works out in the end. But yes, I mean, you've got that difficulty in the play itself anyway. But yes, it's it's just a very interesting setting, I think, and a very interesting 
time period to set it in. And of course, it being set in the north, because that's broadsides and that's their remit, is to have northern voices yeah. speaking yeah. Shakespeare. And so, yeah, the time and the place, I think, is a very interesting, very interesting set. And it's also very familiar to people, I think. Yeah, I mean, you said before that it gets quite dark, but it couldn't really get much darker with the, the scenes with Hero where, where she's basically finished socially. And then they, they told her, the person who formerly was in love with her, is told that she's dead. I mean, it's pretty, pretty as dark as it can get, isn't it, for a comedy? It's very dark for a comedy, actually, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I think comedies can do that. And I think the best modern comedies do that, too, yeah. you know. TV programs or whatever, when you're watching it, and it can get really dark. But there's always that hope, I think, with a comedy. Whereas in a tragedy, it will stay dark and everyone dies. Yes. <laughs> that, you know, that's the difference. It's not just because it's a comedy it doesn't need to be. It doesn't mean that it's going to be ha ha and jolly all the way through. It just needs to end on a on a high note, and people get married, and it ends positively. But you can go to those very dark places in a comedy. Of course you can. And this play does it. And it does it incredibly well. That, that, that marriage scene is incredibly powerful. Because, you know, you have this poor girl being wrongfully accused of something. You even have a father turning on her and wishing she was dead. And then when that's all finished, you have the wonderful bit with Beatrice and Benedict where amidst all this nightmare, they profess their love for each other. And just as you get a glimmer of hope for those two, Beatrice turns around and says to Benedict, but I want you to kill Claudio for me. Which in the end of the scene, he says, OK, I will. And that's one of his best mates. Yeah. So it gets very, it gets very dour, but only for that moment. And it's incredible. It's an incredible bit of drama. But then the mood is lightened as time goes on. And of course, it ends on a, ends on a high and everyone will go off with uh, hopefully clapping and cheering and laughing and, and we'll be singing and dancing and it'll be great. <laughs> yeah. Ends on a song and a dance. Yes, it ends on a song and a dance. <laughs> so um, you've got this tour, as you said, uh, I, don't, I think um, you're coming near to me in May, the, to the Lowry, so it, it's going on for quite a few months and then you're finishing in Germany. So that's um, it's quite a long period of work on, on one play. Have you got anything longer than you were expecting, in fact? <laughs> But uh, have you got anything lined up for after that? Or is that as far as you're thinking so far? That's as far as I'm thinking so far. Yeah, it's it's early days, really. I think, um, yeah, it's often nice to in this business to know what you're sort of doing for a long period of time. But, um, I, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what I'll be doing later on this year. I think it's a little early even to be for me. It's certainly I, it's the last thing on my mind at the moment. But I think as the tour goes on, I'll start thinking, ooh, I need, I need to get something to do. Probably, probably have a bit of a holiday, actually, over the summer holidays. And then, um, yeah, try and find something for the autumn. Are you yeah. doing Panto again this year? Panto? Well, the Panto at the LBT will be Sleeping Beauty. Um, they've not approached me yet, so I'm not going to comment on right. that. <laughs> Maybe they won't want to. Who knows? But, yes, they're certainly doing a Panto next, next Christmas. They're doing Sleeping Beauty. So uh, I'll wait and see what they say about that. But, yeah, no, that would be lovely. That would be lovely to do that. Robin Simpson appears as Benedict in the Northern Broadsides production of Much Ado About Nothing, which runs at the New Vic Theatre in Newcastle under Lyme, Staffordshire, from the 8th of February to the 2nd of March 2019, before embarking on a national tour until the end of May to the Dukes in Lancaster, Stephen Joseph Theatre in Scarborough, Salisbury Playhouse... Derby Theatre, Theatre Royal Bury St Edmunds, Lawrence Batley Theatre in Huddersfield, Viaduct Theatre in Halifax, The Lowry in Salford, York Theatre Royal and Harrogate Theatre. For more information, see www.northern-broadsides.co.uk. You've been listening to a podcast from British Theatre Guide. For more information, please visit britishtheatreguide.info.